Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is TB Sky, and Riot has released another comic for League of Legends, and you know what that means. It means I'm going to spend about half an hour talking about everything I think it does right and everything I think it does wrong. And it's a bit of a mixed bag this time. It is Miss Fortune with a story of her own called Fortune Smiles. But before we get into it, as usual, we're going to talk about the credits because being a comic artist myself, I care a lot about the credits for comics. And again, I'll take this opportunity to mention that League of Legends really needs to start putting writer's credits on the writing they put out, as well as the comics that they... Like, they do it on the comics, they should do it on the writing as well. They should really include credits with their animated shorts, which I think they haven't done for a bunch of them. Because this stuff is kind of important. Anyway, the writer for this one is Anthony Birch. The art and cover is by Ramon Perez. Perez? I'm not sure how to pronounce that one. Colorist is... Oh, God, I'm not sure how to pronounce that one at all. The colorist is Michelle Azarasa Korn, and that's definitely wrong. Letterer is Cardinal Ray. The senior editor, once again, is Ellie, Ellie Pyle. The art director is Eric Kenate, who is fantastic on Twitter. He posts some amazing doodles if you follow him. The production artist is Gabriella Downey, and the logo design again by Yedet Wincor. And we see these names prop up, crop up again and again, which is... Understandable, because Riot probably has a dedicated team for this stuff. Anyway, Miss Fortune getting her very own comic, which is very nice. She is one of the characters who featured heavily in the lore back in the uh, Bilgewater event where she killed Gangplank, which was kind of a big deal uh, for League of Legends universe and the lore in particular. He, he's fine. He came back with a robot arm, but you know. Anyway, this comic seems to be following up from that and kind of establishing what happens in the aftermath of Gangplank's death and how Miss Fortune herself um, reacts to it, how she's dealing with the aftermath of the death of the guy who she has been chasing for the murder of her mother since she was a little girl. First comment I have for this thing, and I have a number of comments for this thing, is that the art is really, really pretty. It's a really particular art style. It's got a very scribbly quality to it. It's clearly, it's very digital. It's extremely digital art, which is an odd comment to make, but it's, 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 it's an art style that, that takes advantage of what digital art can do for you. Especially, I'm talking about, if you look closely at the pages, you'll see almost everything has colored outlines. You'll find very few pure black colors in this comic at all, which gives the whole thing this very soft look. I'm not sure what else to call it, but a soft look, like, because without the pure black edges to cut through the page and delineate everything clearly, you get a, a look that is much less graphic, much less, I mean, it's the polar opposite of something like, maybe not the polar opposite, but certainly an opposite of the kind of stuff you see in Frank Miller comics, especially Sin, Sin City, where everything is delineated into black and white, whereas with this thing, Everything is much more a gradient of colors. And it's pretty, and it works, and the backgrounds in this thing are just absolutely 100% gorgeous. I, I encourage you to download the images, um, it, to get them in the fullest of full sizes, and take a look at them really closely, because there's just a lot of gorgeous work that's gone into these backgrounds, and into creating a physical sense of place for these things. Um, there are times, like, the opening Bilgewater backgrounds here are just absolutely stunning. I, I, there's a lot of love put into those. But there are things that the artist seems to have a little bit more trouble rendering. Like, for instance, these uh, drapes, these curtains, which don't, to me, at least look like cloth. Um, and this is just a minor thing, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see, because you can kind of divine where that artist has spent a lot of time, and clearly they understand how to do architecture, they understand how to do, uh, compose a background so it looks interesting, because look, the background is composed such that we have this big ship house over here, and the bridge underneath, and then uh, some buildings here, and, and the bridge up top, right? Which creates this natural frame, this natural space where the text can breathe, so that the text isn't set on top of things that are pretty in detail, so you get this, and the stuff behind here is very nice as well, but you get this open space where the text can kind of breathe, and it doesn't clutter up the page and distract it too much, which, again, is is something that can be quite difficult to keep in mind, especially when you want to do some really big, gorgeous backgrounds, finding places to put the text, to put the text boxes, 
that makes them a natural part of the page and don't look like they were sort of copy pasted on top of it and attached with crazy glue. I'm gonna have a few comments on the writing in this one as well, by the way, um, because there's there's a couple of things that that just hmm, kind of don't work. So let's start with these opening lines. Bilgewater. It's been six months since I killed the man who mur murdered my parents. That's Gangplank. After Gangplank's death, the four strongest crews, Crows, Harkers, Brags, and mine, split up the city and declared a truce. Then they set to work cannibalizing Bilgewater. <laughs> now... Writing and art kind of has to work together in order to establish a comic, in order, in order to make it work, right? So, the way that they choose to show um, that Bilgewater is kind of turning on itself, cannibalizing itself in this panel is some dude steals something from another dude's purse. And then that's kind of it. Which I feel like is a little bit of a missed opportunity, where if you want... The crux of the story is that Sarah Fortune is about to kill the other three pirate gang leaders of Bilgewater and take control of the entire city for herself because she, she sees it as necessary. She justifies it to herself by saying, the city is falling apart, there's no leadership, these gang leaders are just are ruining the place, tearing it apart, turning people against each other, I have to stop it, I have to fix it. Which is a perfectly good justification, and, and we can accept when she says it, she probably knows what she's talking about. But there's a missed opportunity here to show it in the comic that it's not just some pickpocket steals, like, a thing from a dude, but a full-fledged civil pandemonium where people, like, kill each other in the streets, or um, people are denied their freedoms, or, like, something genuinely bad is gonna happen, because for all that Bilgewater is kind of a weirdly put-together, piratey looking place, nothing in, in the, sort of, the art, or the backgrounds, or the things that we see imply to me that things are falling, like, that, that there's pandemonium or chaos or destruction going on on a grand scale that demands action so violent as to, you know, necessitate the murder of other gang leaders in order to unify things. Like, when you had that grand political ambition, and we need, as readers, we also need to be able to sympathize with misfortune that at least she thinks that the things that she is about to do are necessary, which means we need to see things from her perspective, and from her perspective, it looks like Bilgewater is falling apart. That needs to be visualized in the comic, and they kind of, because it needs, I mean, this is not like, um, uh, huge failure. I've spent a lot of time talking about it because this is something that interests me, but it's not like a huge deal because this is a comic that's not really... It wants to get through the introductions as fast as possible so it could spend the majority of its runtime setting up the three other pirate leaders, setting up Misfortune's relationship to them, and detailing the plot that she goes through in order to resolve the issue, right? It's just... I would have liked them to just extend it one more page. One more page with a couple of panels showing people getting shaken down in the streets and thugs intimidating shop owners and children and parents getting thrown out into the street by unscrupulous landlords or whatever. Something to, to, to show us visually what the writing is telling us. Speaking of the writing, I could kill him, sure, but the monster hunters of the slaughter ducks have an old saying, decapitate a serpent and it'll just grow more heads. Right? I agree, but if you can charm a serpent, suddenly the snake pit becomes pretty cozy. This doesn't work. It I just, With apologies to Mr. Birch, this doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Uh, at least not for me. Mileage may vary from person to person, sure, but first of all, the monster hunters of the slaughter docks. What? Okay, so we can infer that there are monster hunters, and they hang around a place called the Slaughter Ducks. But nowhere in this story, and indeed, like, I've, I read a lot of League of Legends lore. I don't memorize all of it, because, frankly, a lot of it isn't very memorable. But when you're introducing these two concepts, monster hunters and slaughter ducks... 
you're telling us that these mean something to the character in the story. Like, she has some cultural understanding of what, what monster hunters are, what kinds of monsters they hunt, what kinds of people they are, whether they're heroes or they're mercenaries or, like, whatever. And she has some concept of what the slaughter docks are. But we don't. And this comic doesn't really do much to tell us what the slaughter docks are and, and, and what they mean. The, uh, we get a, a view of the slaughter docks again, and I seem to recall something about the slaughter docks being the place where the month where like fishermen essentially bring the big giant whale creatures they catch to kill them and slaughter them. And you can sort of see that implied with the creature kind of hanging over the bloody docks in this shot. But this is the only other time the slaughter docks figure in um in this whole story, right? And it's just kind of okay, but if you're introducing these concepts, and this is something we're going to be talking about quite a bit for this one, it's a question of planting and payoff. What they're doing here is planting stuff. They're planting concepts, they're planting ideas, they're planting terminology in our heads with the expectation, and the expectation that you have as a reader is that when something comes up in the writing, when they mention a certain type of person or a profession or a certain type of place, it's because it's somehow relevant to the story, right? It's if, if like, for instance, if in Star Wars, Ben Kenobi had spent a lot of the first movie talking about, oh, the Force that moves through us and uh, binds us together, and uh, the Force gives the Jedi's powers, and then imagine if the Force never comes up again at all in the first Star Wars movie. Like, Luke just uses the targeting computer to blow up the Death Star, and it never comes up. It's never mentioned again. It doesn't come up. He doesn't use force powers. Nothing about it ever, ever gets mentioned or gets introduced. You would feel really fucking weird about that movie, right? That would be kind of... The force would still seem kind of cool, but... But what, then why was he spending all that time talking about the Force if it wasn't because it was set, it was planting the concept that was going to pay off when Luke destroys the Death Star, right? Planting and payoff. You plant a concept and then you pay it off. You might also have seen this kind of thing referred to as Chekhov's gun, um, which is a concept in, um, in stage plays where if you're going to put a prop on stage, like a gun, for instance, don't just put the gun on stage for fun. Put it on stage because it's going to be fired at some point during the play, right? Planting and payoff. Don't tease people with these ideas that you're not going to follow up on and and pay off on. And it doesn't follow up on. And this is this is a pet peeve. The reason I'm harping so much about this one text box is because League of Legends lore does this all the freaking time. All the freaking time. A lot of their lore stories, a lot of their lore stuff, they plant things over and over and over again. They plant things and plant things and plant things and bring up concepts and special types of people and professions and special places in the League of Legends universe, and then they never ever pay off on it. Like, they never bring it up again within the same story, and you should be very lucky to see any of the concepts come up in the other stories, and it's really annoying me. Anyway, the line I wanted to talk about, I agree, but if you can charm a serpent, suddenly the snake pit becomes pretty cozy, is a weird-ass line. Because charming a serpent, like, the association I have, and I suspect most people have, is a snake charmer. Like, the dude with the whistle who plays a little song and the snake kind of stands up out of a basket and, and looks at the, at the flute, and he's from India, probably. Like, that's the association that comes up in my mind, but... Nowhere in my mind do I have the idea that, oh, the guy with the flute who's doing the snake charming thing, he could probably just jump into a pit of snakes. Like, full of, like, just a, just a big fucking pit full of cobras, and he'd be super fine. It would be cozy because he can charm snakes. So it's weird. That's a weird, it's supposed to be this kind of clever line that, that, that shows us Misfortune's kind of sardonic personality, um, and, and, guts and, and character, but it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Snake charmers don't jump into snake pits. They don't sleep in there. They don't hang out with, like, poison snakes constantly having, they, it, they just charm them. It's a weird line. Anyway, planting and payoff. The reason I bring that up is because we've got a bit of planting that does pay off right here. In keeping with the rules of parlay, please hand over all weaponry. Happy to. This is planting, and it pays off later in the story, where, when Misfortune 
invites the gang leaders to the slaughterhouse where she murders them all. She is standing outside in disguise and she mirrors the line from the this uh, third page perfectly. In keeping with the rules of parley, please hand over all weapons. Please hand over all weapons. Please hand, like... And it pays off because it's been set up, it's been planted that parley means you can disarm a group of pirates, take away their weapons, and gain an advantage. In the first sequence, the other gang leaders use it to gain an advantage over misfortune. They take away her guns, they disarm her, and they force her into a position where she has to do what they want and not interfere. Here, she does the exact same thing back to them. She takes away their weapons, and once they are disarmed, she fucking murders them. That is planting, that is payoff, and it's very well done. And it's the kind of thing that, when you have a story that is this short, right? When you have a story that's that's so few pages and so relatively little um, action and dialogue and character development that can be shoved into those pages, planting and payoff like this is a brilliant way to frame the story. That is very well done. And I, after all the harping on the writing I did earlier, that's something I want to say that that was very well done. Structurally, that's very clever. It works very, very well. Now, the other, th the other theme that's going on in this comic is that Miss Fortune has murdered Gangplank. She has essentially taken his place um, as a leader, but she doesn't want to become him. She kind of struggles with, in order to take power over a city like Bilgewater, you have to be a violent, sadistic pirate king like Gangplank, but she doesn't want to be a violent, sadistic Gangplank pirate king because Gangplank murdered her parents and her entire life is about not being like him, right? If I move fast enough, I could get my guns from the doorman. Who first, Brack, Crow? Doesn't matter. I have to kill them all. Quick, I, I have to. No, I'm thinking like him. That's her conflict in the story, is that she wants to take power over Bilgewater. She wants to fix things, but she doesn't want to become like Gangplank. And then by the end of the story, she has murdered all of them. She has taken sole power over Bilgewater. And the way that she resolves it emotionally like the way she finds her emotional resolution to having done exactly what gangplank would do is yes killing these men is exactly what gangplank would have done but i tried to do things the nice way these bastards just gave me no choice i'm gonna run this city the right way and if that means i gotta kill some more built scummers in the process makes for a few less serpents in the world and here again planting and payoff serpents were a theme in the lines I was complaining so much about, and here they're calling back to it that she sees them not as people, but as animals, essentially, as serpents, as monsters, as irredeemable creatures that that aren't nice to have in the world. Again, the metaphors get a little confused because in the opening lines, as we discussed a lot, if you can charm a serpent, the snake pit becomes pretty cozy. This implies... She's fine with them. Like, it, yeah, I'm not going to think about them as animals. I'm not going to think about them as monsters. She's trying, this writing is trying to set up the idea that serpents maybe aren't so bad. So I think the, and the reason it gets confused is because Miss Fortune's tension, her story tension in this story is about her not wanting to be like Gangplank. And as the story resolves, she has essentially become just like Gangplank. But she resolves it by saying, no, no, I tried to do things the nice way. I tried to do things the right way. I wasn't, I didn't just kill them. I gave them a chance. They gave me no choice, so I had to do it. And what's not entirely clear to me is, is the comic saying that, oh, no, she has actually taken a step towards becoming another gangplank, like becoming that same because the because power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and misfortune is becoming corrupted by power, and that is part of her character development? Or is the writing trying to tell us that she has found another, like, she's taken the third option, instead of you can either be not like Gangplank and get screwed out of all your influence by the other gang leaders who are happy to screw you over like Gangplank would, or you could be like Gangplank completely and fuck them over first, and there are no in-betweens, and is the story then saying that she has found a happy medium where she can do what's needed, what needs to be done without becoming like Gangplank? That's where I'm a bit confused, where the writing is not quite clear, because she is murdering a dude who is defenseless, just kind of sitting there, and she's smiling about it because she's getting revenge for a 
shitty line that he threw at her earlier in the story. Again, planting and payoff. This, the ending is planted. Let's see, it's... Uh, here. <laughs> this is Crow, the guy she murders in the last panel. Don't frown, smile, you look pretty that way. Very violent. This, she does not like being told to smile and being told to be pretty. Because that's a shitty thing to say to a person, no matter who they are. And then they, they plant that, and then they pay it off with, Hey, Crow, I'm smiling, and then she shoots him in the fucking head. Again, that is very well... Again, structurally, for a short story like this, that is a very good way to frame it. It gives us clear framing devices, and it, it gives the story boundaries so that we know what it is resolving. Here, we resolve the slight from the earlier point in the story. When she dresses up as a guardsman and takes away the weapons, we are resolving the thing that was brought up by the guardsman taking away her weapons at the start of the story, and so on and so on. It creates a very strong framing device for how to get the story across in so few pages as you've got going here. But again, it's like... But the confusion comes in that the story is also setting up this idea that by doing what Gangplank would have done, she's becoming closer to becoming him, right? But is that what this... Like, she's smiling while she's murdering a guy. Is that because she's becoming like Gangplank? Or is it because we are paying off on the thing that was explicitly set up earlier in the story where she pissed him off by being a sexist dick to her? Which is it? Is it both? Because if it's both, that kind of needs to be indicated. The thing I might have liked was instead of Gangplank's only appearance in this thing being this flashback panel where she thinks about the moment her parents were murdered by him. Instead of that, I might have liked an extended flashback where she remembers how Gangplank used to act, like the ways he used to run the city, the brutality, the cruelty, the evil that he did. Because that sets that would set us up clearer that if we see Misfortune doing the same things that he did, systematically mirroring the way that Gangplank behaved, then we would get clear resolution of, is this about her becoming like Gangplank, or is it about her finding another way to do things? But because all we have to compare her state of mind to is this flashback where Gangplank murders her mother, but it doesn't really say anything about how he conducts his politics, essentially. It's kind of... Is she... That's why I'm, I'm feeling a little bit... Like, this, the writing here is a little bit weaker uh, than it wants to be. The writing wants to say something strong and interesting about how power affects people, what people must do in order to stay in power and, and in order to, you know, keep control over a city which is essentially, you know, a feudalist, lawless society. But, yeah, because we don't really have that much to compare it to, because we don't have that much to hold it up against, we only have the story in itself. <sighs> yeah, I mean, for my money, it kind of doesn't get there. Anyway, the art, once again, the backgrounds are absolutely gorgeous, but the thing I perhaps want to talk most about, well, a couple of things. First, the faces, because there is a inconsistency that's going on. I don't know if it, maybe it's because of the colored outlines, but then this panel particularly, is it just me or does Misfortune's head look like somewhat too big for her body? And then in this panel, it looks a lot smaller and like there's some inconsistency in keeping the characters on model from panel to panel. We can also see that with um, Captain Bragg here. Look at his face here and look at his face here and then look at his face in this panel. I'm not sure those two look quite like the same person. And then later in the comic, where was it? Here, again. Like, Captain Bragg is a little... a little inconsistent from page to page, and the same thing goes for Crow. Look at this guy here. Um, and by the way, I'm reasonably sure those two panels are copy-pasted. Look at Crow as he looks there. Then look at Crow as he looks here. Something about the facial construction is different. It's off. And it's the same thing when we look back to the meeting. Again, it's like the eyes and the nose and something about it all seems just a little bit inconsistent, a little bit off. 
And this is something that kind of plagues the story throughout, because Misfortune's Phase 2 seems to be changing a little bit from page to page. And this is something that can happen, like, if the artist has not drawn Misfortune a lot before, before they were commissioned to work on this thing, or before they, they started working on this thing, figuring out how that character is, fits in your hand, like how you want to depict them, how you want to show them, that can be a long process. It can take a long time to get it right, and just over the course of like a 10-page comic or whatever, things can change a lot. Because here, Misfortune's eyes are pretty big, and then they're pretty small, and then they're sort of big again, and then they're somewhat smaller, and then they don't have quite as much eye shadow. So there's some inconsistency going on. Um, and because of the colored outlines on a lot of the line art, I think, and because the shadows are relatively subtle and, and a little weak, a lot of the pages end up looking sometimes rather flat. Um, let's see, there was a page I had in mind. This one, for instance. This is a page with a lot of depth going on in it, or rather one that should have a lot of depth going on in it. Um, but because of the way the shading and the coloring and the lines work, all of this furniture seems to be at the same place in the frame as Misfortune, but what's meant to be communicated here is that she's using the table as a shield against the bullets that he's firing at her, right? But it the table doesn't really look like it's between her and him. It looks like it's next to her, and the chair looks like it's in front of her. And it's like, and these things happen every once in a while in this thing, where because the the of the art style, I think I think it's because of the colored outline and the particular use of light and shadows that it gets a little flat at some uh, at times. Like the same thing goes for this panel here. How far away are these two characters from each other? Like, uh, like how far away is the door from this pillar? If the shadows and the shading had been more pronouncedly different, that would have been easier to tell. And again, because this is the meeting at night inside of a warehouse, right? So where is all this bright-ass light coming from? Like, they have pretty bright lights falling on them. In darkness, when things are mostly dark, what you'd get is not a lot of shadows at all, because the light will be very low and, and rather consistent. Or if there is a very bright light source in the room, what you would get would be very heavy, sharp shadows, especially if there's only one or two light sources, like, hanging way up above or hanging close down, because the, the comic never shows us the interior of the warehouse very much. We don't know if there is a lamp or where there is a lamp, so the use of lighting in this comic is a little bit... Because I think, again, it's also something to do with this panel here, for instance. How much more powerful would the shot have been if what we're seeing here is the instant that the gun is firing, so we get, instead of these rather soft shadows, we get very stark, sharp, almost completely pure black shadow is kind of framing her in this really sharp light. That would make the that would make it stand out more. That would make it make it more striking. At least I think so. So yeah. All in all, I think the writing is a little bit hit and miss in this thing. It's a little bit hit and miss. Um and the art is a little bit hit and miss. But what I like about it is it's a very effective use of planting and payoff. Structurally the story is sound. And that's, that's something that alone is worth admiring. It makes, it makes the story worth reading. It's fun to see that planting and payoff. I also like that it gives Misfortune character development. This is something I have uh, complained about when I did the review of the Saria comic that Overwatch released, where they give Saria some real character development, which is something that the League of Legends comics have been kind of short on. They have mostly been about explaining and deepening the lore, but not so much about moving the characters' stories further. They do that with this comic, and I'm very pleased to see that. Now, I think uh, 30 minutes, which is what this thing is going to clock in at, is pretty appropriate for a story and a comic uh, like this. So if you have any comments, you should feel free to leave them down below. I'm very happy that Riot are doing more comics and more stories for their characters. I have been depressed by the lack of lore coming out from that company for a long time. I'm very happy to see them taking advantage of comics. I want to give them props for that. I want them to continue doing it. Because I like League of Legends, I like the stories, I like the characters, I think they deserve a lot more exploration than they're frankly getting. And yeah, any comments, leave them down below. You can leave a like, you can leave a dislike. I 
don't control you. You can do it if you want to. I promise I won't hunt you down and kill you for it. This slight against my honor. That got a little dark. And, um, yeah. I shall see you, I suppose, in the next video. Cheers. <laughs>